and we will have the recording available um, when we uh, when we're finished up. Um, it's 11:02, and we have a we already have a good number of people here. So I'm going to start with introductions um, and repeat some of the information that I've already uh, presented. I'm John Pfeffer. I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. I direct the Foreign Policy and Focus Program and the Global Just Transition Program. Uh, I will provide a link to the Global Just Transition Program in chat so you have a chance to, uh, to see the other work that we've been doing. Um, I've asked uh, our participants to introduce themselves uh, in chat. So if you open up chat, you'll get a chance to see uh, people uh, who are with you in this enormous virtual room of ours. Um, and uh, I'll also repeat that we have interpretation, uh, French to English simultaneous, which is available at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, also a live transcript option. Um, you'll also notice that there's a Q&A function at the bo bottom of your screen. Uh, and that's where we'll ask you to put any questions you might have. Uh, and we will answer as many as we can. We've gotten a couple to begin with. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by introducing our expert speaker. Um, we're very pleased to have Julie Klinger uh, join us. And Julie is an assistant professor at the University of Delaware. She's also the author of a really fantastic book that came out in 2017 called Rare Earth Frontiers from Terrestrial Subsoils to Lunar Landscapes with a, an emphasis on uh, looking at uh, rare earth minerals in Brazil and China, but also in outer space, uh, which is often referred to as the final frontier. Um, so a number of different uh, locations. And uh, Julie has joined us uh, to talk about rare earth elements and uh, what they are um, and where they are located around the world, uh, why they are not necessarily rare, despite the fact that they're called rare earth elements. Um, in, the, uh, in her opening remarks, she'll answer these kind of basic questions uh, where they're located around the world, um, why they're important, how they figure in, uh, in, in energy projects, especially uh, renewable energy, uh, what countries are mostly involved in the mining uh, and the processing of rare earth minerals. Um, so Julie, uh, please, let's, let's hear your thoughts on those questions, and then we'll, we'll proceed to to some of the other questions from our audience. Excellent, sounds good. Thank you, John. And thank you all for uh, your time and attention uh, gathering here. We have a global audience today. And uh, I'm really encouraged by the fact that uh, people from so many different places are committed to uh, thinking deeply and understanding uh, any, any and all of the potential issues around rare earth and other critical material sourcing. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll begin with a short presentation, um, just tell you a little bit more about uh, where I'm coming from and the basis of my research. And then um, you know, presuming, presuming no knowledge, no prior knowledge um, on rare earths going into this. And so um, I'll give you a kind of overview of rare earths and critical, so-called critical materials more generally. Um, and then we will uh, leave the rest of the time for question and answer and discussion, uh, because I want to make sure that you're able to ask all the questions that you're able to ask. And um, I will promise uh, or commit to you to be uh, very clear about uh, what I know based on my own research, what I know based on secondary research and what I don't yet know. Um, in order to uh, enable you to make uh, the best decisions that you can make as well. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and share my screen.
Okay, so as John mentioned, um, a lot of what I have to share with you today uh, can be found in my book, um, uh, Rare Earth Frontiers, which was based on five years of in-depth field work and mixed methods and multilingual research in China, the US, Brazil, and Germany. Uh, why those countries in particular? Um, I was interested in understanding why uh, global rare earth production had concentrated in China and what the what the historical antecedents were for that, what the social, environmental, and economics impact impact were impacts were in China, and then uh, following uh, China's efforts to uh, clean up and consolidate its domestic industry, I was interested in understanding then what the uh, impacts were in different parts of the world. Uh, one of the key things that I found um, is that resource extraction, as we've currently organized it is inseparable from the politics of sacrifice, meaning that uh, in order to source the raw materials that are needed for the global economy, uh, it's organized according to this logic that someone somewhere, some livelihoods, some landscapes have to be sacrificed, someone has to pay the price in this sort of utilitarian approach. Uh, but it is, um, I, am, I am convinced that we can change this and it's this conviction that's been the basis of my policy work and ongoing research to support sustainable rare earth sourcing. Um, just a little bit more uh, about the research. This gives you a sense of the geography of it uh, between 2010 and 2015. Of course, uh, working with colleagues, research assistants, collaborators in different parts of the world, the, the geographical extent of my research has increased. But just to give you a sense that if you, that if you look at the book uh, for further information, you'll find the story distributed among these geographies. Um, some other relevant work for myself, uh, mainly I'd like to highlight uh, here that I'm a U.S. delegate to the International Standards Organization, the technical committee that is tasked with coming up with international standards for uh, rare earth transparency, traceability, and sustainability. And so this is an international team, uh, folks from uh, the U.S., Canada, several uh, European countries, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and a number of other countries, um, including Russia, Brazil, and South Africa are observing uh, the process. And so this is literally we're uh, figuring out uh, how to actually develop best practices standards at the moment. Um, and it's, it's a challenging process. A number of the people involved are um, their specialists within the industry or within mining engineering or metallurgy or things like that. Um, and so the responsibility that I have as a field based researcher who's specifically on the social and environmental impacts uh, is to uh, make sure that the standards actually correspond to uh, improving uh, the impacts on landscapes and livelihoods on the ground. So here's what you can expect, as mentioned. Um, we'll talk through the basics, um, and then we'll get into some persistent myths I'll come up with uh, in the Q&A. And then um, as the questions direct us uh, to look at other points, I'll ta toggle back and forth between uh, the presentation screen share on and off. Uh, just to give you an overview, uh, the term rare earth elements refers to 17 uh, roughly chemically similar elements that are circled here in the periodic table. Uh, they're mostly found in what's called the lanthanide series, uh, which is numbers 57 to 71 uh, here, and also scandium and yttrium. Now, even though I just said that rare earths are uh, chemically similar, they are, of course, unique, each and every one of these elements. But the thing that makes them important and uh, now highly sought after is that they do have um, fantastic magnetic and conductive properties, which means that uh, they've enabled, among other things, the miniaturization of technologies. So it's thanks to rare earth elements that our computers are the size of a tablet or our smartphone and not the size of you know, a building, for example or a house. Uh, they are also important for producing uh, really high powered magnets. And so you can see here, um, I've included an image of several of their different applications, the navigation components for, for drone technology, magnets for uh, maglev trains, 
uh, magnets used in wind turbines, even in uh, big physics. Here we have a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. And then they also have a number of interesting optical properties as well. So uh, certain elements like cerium, for example, cerium, which is of course number um, 58 here, Cerium, when it's applied to glassware, uh, confers this lovely pink color, right? It's also used then uh, for lasers. And also uh, those lasers are, are used for things like uh, precision guided missiles. Uh, rare earth elements are also, cerium itself is another example, um, another example of the use of cerium is that it's used as a signal amplifier in fiber optic, optic cables. So it's because of the signal amplifying properties of cerium that's placed you know, every 30 kilometers or so in a transoceanic fiber optic cable that we're able to have uh, high speed uh, global internet communications as an example. Other elements are used in things like um, compact, fl compact fluorescent light bulbs in dental implants, and also, of course, in advanced uh, medical and transportation technology. And so what I want, the reason I um, am presenting to you this wide array of different uses or applications for the elements is uh, because I would like you to come away with um, an understanding that rare earth elements, yes, they are very important for renewable energy technology and that sort of thing. But even if we weren't in the moment of uh, an international push for a transition away from fossil fuels and toward renewable energy generation, um, rare earth elements would still be important and would still be highly sought after, whether it's for consumer electronics, medical, scientific, or military uh, or transportation uh, technologies. Um, and I'd also like uh, you to, uh, uh, come away with an understanding of where rare earth elements fit within the broader um, initiative undertaken by the EU, by the US, China, and a number of other countries to put together these lists of what are called critical materials or strategic materials. And uh, so just a quick reminder, rare earths are the lanthanide series here. And of course, also including scandium and yttrium. And the color coding on this uh, representation of the periodic table of elements shows how what, what is counted as critical changes over time. And this, of course, has implications then for which places are targeted in uh, you know, uh, by extractive interests at different times. So the yellow indicates that these elements were listed as critical in 2011, orange that they were listed as critical in 2014, and red that they were listed as critical in 2017. And so you can see while there is broad consistency, uh, it does change over time. And uh, there's a couple of different things that explain this change over time, but one of them is um, government or regulatory perception of uh, what industry needs. And so, of course, all the elements, we can make the argument that all the elements here are really important. You know, there's some elements here like, like nickel, which is instrumental in all the applications that I mentioned on the previous page, but, um, it's not always listed and often not listed as critical. Um, but when you list something as critical or call it rare, um, it heightens the significance around it. And um, it also can put people in a situation where if they are um, objecting to mining or the location of an industrial site, um, you know, within uh, their local environment or context, it can put them in a position where um, they're seen as arguing against something that's essential or necessary. And that um, may or may not always be the case, depending on the element that we're talking about. Um, so according, I want to give you a definition. Um, what are critical materials? Right. According to the US Department of Energy, a critical material is any substance that is used in technology that is subject to supply risk and for which there are no easy substitutes. So rare earth elements are a subset of critical materials. Not all critical materials are rare earths, uh, but all rare earths are critical, are considered critical materials. And I'll repeat that later if, that, if that's needed. 
or a, a plain language definition of critical material is the stuff that you really need but can't always get. And of course, they're talking about four different industrial applications. Um, and of course, the list of materials that are considered critical depends on who, where, and when you ask. So these are um, often country or regional, regionally specific. And of course, um, what is counted as critical depends more on the geography of supply chains. So that means where is the extractive infrastructure located? Where is the refining and processing taking place? And where are the end use or consumer markets? So whether something is critical or vulnerable to disruption or supply risk, according to the US Department of Energy definition, depends on how this whole geography of the supply chain is organized, rather than whether or not they're actually common or scarce in the Earth's crust. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what, what I mean by that in just a moment. Now, there's a number of different approaches that are taken to address what's called the critical raw materials problem. Um, so there's, of course, policy initiatives uh, called raw materials diplomacy um, in order to uh, build different international agreements to uh, increase the rate of extraction in order to increase the global supply of critical raw materials. But, uh, when I say global, um, of course, the major markets for critical raw materials are uh, Europe, North America, China, and Russia. Um, and so we need to also be attentive to that, um, that what is often defined as a global problem uh, is actually covering the concerns of a handful of major consuming economies. Um, other approaches are to uh, increase the rate of mining, increase recycling, uh, to increase the lifetime of the technologies that use raw materials, to find new or substitute materials, and to improve uh, manufacturing practices to be more efficient and um, maybe more readily repaired or reusable. Now back to rare earths. Um, I'm showing you a chart here um, that was put together by uh, the visual capitalist, but if you uh, research you know, rare earths uh, online, you're going to come across a chart that looks more or less like this. This one was put together by the visual capitalist. And what the story that is told here, you know, so here uh, on the vertical axis, we see the total volume of metric tons of production of rare earth elements. And then here on the horizontal axis, we see the timeline between 1985 and estimated 2020. And what you can see here is um, over time, beginning in uh, the 1980s, but really taking off in the mid 1990s, uh, China took on uh, a very significant share of global production uh, to the point where. Um, uh, shortly after the turn of the millennium, uh, China accounted for 97% um, of global production. And so this was a de facto monopoly. Um, and then you can see here that, um, uh, that US production has increased. And then what's interesting here and what's often, um, there's a lot of important stuff happening in this category, rest of the world, that is often sort of flattened into a single category like we see here. Um, and so uh, I will of course make these slides available if you'd like to look at them on your own time. Um, but what explains this development? There's all sorts of theories, conspiracy theories, all of this stuff, particularly if you're speaking from the US context uh, like I am. But based on my uh, in-depth historical research, uh, the explanation for this shift in global production over time uh, is basic, it basically comes down to this. In the latter 20th century, as Western countries were opting out of rare earth mining and processing, China was opting in by scaling up investments, by subsidizing uh, industry and industrial development, and increase in research and development as other countries were scaling down. Um, and so it was really a combination of factors, a shift in policy in the US and Western Europe that happened to complement perfectly uh, shifting policy in China, um, particularly as China was undergoing economic reforms in the 1980s, you know, opening up the country to more investment, 
um, and more industrial growth uh, right around the time that um, Western countries were removing capital controls to make it easier for Western companies to circle the globe, looking for places with uh, uh, less stringent environmental and occupational health and safety standards and regulations. So, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is actually in here uh, twice. But uh, the other thing that I wanted to note here, and this is a very confusing kind of spaghetti and meatballs type uh, diagram, um, but it shows a number of the different applications of critical materials. Rare earth elements are listed here, light rare earths and heavy rare earths. And you can see a number of them are used in uh, motors, uh, wind turbines and fuel cells, but they are also used importantly in robotics, drones and uh, information and communication technologies with a number of different applications. Um, from renewable energy to uh, transportation to defense and space, space applications as well. Um, but I also want to um, wrap up my sort of opening remarks here by talking about um, a very persistent myth. And this, this myth or misperception is understandable, but I would say the most um, pervasive myth that plagues uh, organizing and decision-making around rare earth elements is this idea that rare earth elements are actually rare. Now, this is a reasonable conclusion or assumption to make because rare is in the name. Uh, but based on my research, it seems that uh, this misnomer, this inaccurate name uh, has been lamented by material science, science, scientists and chemists who work with specific rare earth elements since at least 1907. Why are they called rare if they're not actually rare? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. Um, it's that when they were first discovered in the late 1700s, no one had ever seen them before. And so they were assumed to be rare. <laughs> it's really that simple. But I think the name has stuck around because if you call something rare, that allows you to do things that you might not be able to do otherwise, such as um, force through an extractive agenda in an otherwise protected place. So if, however, we assume that rare earth elements are rare, this leads to a number of dangerous assumptions. And I think these assumptions are very much at play right now. Uh, the first is that China mines the most rare earth elements because China has the greatest rare earth geological endowments. This is simply not the case. Um, a related assumption is that, well, okay, rare earth elements are rare or scarce, so this means that they will be subject to war and conflict, right? And so you've probably seen all kinds of headlines that call rare earths the next, you know, elements of conflict, the next oil, this sort of thing. This is more, um, this tells us more about the public imagination around these materials than it actually tells us about the incidence of materials in the Earth's crust. Um, if we call something rare, we also often assume that if something's rare, then it can only be obtained at a great cost. So great sacrifices, right? This goes back to the um, uh, politics of sacrifice, right? Great sacrifices are justifiable to get this very rare and very necessary thing. And of course, if something is rare, then we imagine that it's hard to find. And so from the perspective of the global north and major institutions in the global north, uh, this has led to the assumption that rare earth elements are concentrated in so-called emerging economies, right? And all of this, um, uh, all of these assumptions are of course uh, reinforced by uh, pop culture, news commentary and some policy. And just in, as an example of how potent this is in pop culture, you know, here we have a screenshot from uh, James Cameron's 2009 film Avatar, uh, where they were looking for something that looks an awful lot like lanthanum, which I just showed previously, but they've, they fictionalized the element by calling it unobtainium, right? And so this idea that you have to go to great lengths to get something that's crucial for technology is very much part of like the public imagination. And that gets projected onto rare earth elements in a way that can really obscure the realities of, of the materials and also undermine organizing for better social and environmental practices. But here's the thing, I wanna explore these implications a little bit further. If we assume that rare earth elements are actually rare, then what are our options 
right? Um, if we assume that they're rare, then otherwise crazy options um, seem reasonable, like mining the moon, digging up the Amazon, uh, charging into a war-torn region, such as in southeastern Afghanistan, uh, taking an East India Company sort of neo-colonial approach to Afghanistan's resources, which was, of course, pitched to the Trump administration by founder of private military contractor uh, Blackwater, Eric Prince, um, and also followed up with an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, uh, destroying biodiversity hotspots where um, rich uh, social and ecological systems live in a sort of climate a uh, resilient way uh, might seem more reasonable, digging under the Greenland ice sheet or scraping up the ocean floor, right? All of these things become reasonable. If our default assumption is that rare earth elements are actually rare, but rare earth elements are not rare, right? Here's a map um, showing several of the at least 800 known deposits that have been documented by the U United States Geological Survey. And you can see that they are dispersed throughout the globe. Um, and so the fact that production is concentrated in China, again, has more to do with how we've organized our industrial geography than their actual incidents in the Earth's crust. But I also mentioned that a related assumption is that uh, rare earth elements and other critical materials are, quote unquote, concentrated in so-called emerging economies. And so here's a screenshot from the Climate Smart Mining Report that was released by the World Bank IFC in October of 2019. If we imagine rare earth elements to be rare, then we in the global north can take a NIMBY approach, right, a not in my backyard approach to mineral resilience or secure supply chains. And I'd like you to note how in this map, no critical materials appear to exist in global north countries. And of course, the point could be made that this is a stylized map. It's not meant to be um, a comprehensive you know, reflection of reality, but this perception is underscored in uh, the text, right? Which really emphasizes the fact that many critical materials will, will come from resource-rich developing countries and emerging economies, uh, which then uh, essentially sets up the uh, major finance institutions of the global north con to continue to reinscribe the global extractive geographies that concentrate extraction uh, in the global south. Of course, with rare earths, there are um, there are exceptions to this occurring in the U.S., Canada, and different parts of northern and western Europe, which we can talk about in the Q and A. So, what I'd like you to note then is that not only rare earths but other critical materials are actually abundant in destination or major consuming markets. Um, so this is a map also from the U.S. Geological Survey that shows present perspective and past mining operations for rare earth elements, for nickel, for chromium, for platinum group elements, carbonatites, and a whole bunch of other materials that fit the critical materials that have made the list for critical materials. But um, I would also like to also offer and end on this note um, a crucial caveat for our current context, which is characterized by climate crises which is this. If you look at this map, this is an, a screenshot from an ongoing mapping project to document the extent of native lands, whether traditional, recognized by treaty or other legal convention or unceded. Um, so look at the geography of native lands, indigenous lands here. Of course, this is an ongoing project, so it's incomplete. Um, but uh, when it comes to addressing our climate problems, um, it's quite important that we no longer presume access to indigenous lands in order to solve resource needs, which of course has been standard operating procedure in settler colonial contexts like the US, the one that I'm speaking from. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why this is the case, but uh, if we're looking just and only at climate resilience, uh, mining on indigenous lands has been shown to undermine climate mitigation and resilience goals wherever the study has taken place. And I think we can expand this point out to say that it's not just indigenous lands, but it's wherever um, subsistence-based uh, rural, agrarian, nomadic, pastoral livelihoods are located uh, that are more climate resilient. When you, when you displace those livelihoods, you also displace the people who are living in, um, in a uh, climate resilient and perhaps even autonomous way and put them in a position where they can no longer maintain these low carbon lifestyles. So 
Um, I'll say that this may seem to present a pretty serious conundrum, given that there are overlapping geographies of indigenous lands and critical materials deposits. But I think there's a way out, and this is what I'll end on, uh, which is this, that currently, less than 1% of all rare earths and 12% 12 12 of all electronics that are consumed are actually recycled. And so even though there's this massive push to open new mines, um, we also have this other problem of accumulating piles of electronic waste um, in different parts of the world, um, when in fact processing this uh, might help us meet our critical resource needs without having to dig new holes in the ground. So that's um, our primer and overview, and I'd like to open it up for Q&A and um, whatever else you'd like to discuss. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Julie. That was fabulous. That really provided an excellent overview and I think probably answered a lot of questions that people had coming to this space. Um, we've had a couple of questions already in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask people for to do three things. The first you've already done, you've introduced yourself in the chat and it's wonderful to see so many people and from so many different places and doing so much wonderful work. So that's the first thing. The second is uh, to put your questions in the Q&A uh, function. It's easier to see those than if you put them in chat um, and we will take those in turn. The third thing I'm gonna ask is one of the, the uh, reasons for having this uh, presentation, of course, is to learn more about rare earth elements, but also to see if there might be some work we can do as a network of, of folks working on these issues. I don't want to assume that everybody here wants to be part of a network. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, to send a note with your email to me, uh, either through the chat function, you can send it directly through chat, or I'm going to put my email in chat. Uh, you can send it directly to me by email. Um, so it would be wonderful to continue this conversation in a very um, practical and action-oriented way after this session is over. Um, but Julie, we have already gotten a couple of questions. Um, and so let's, let's start, uh, if you can, with the last uh, issue you brought up and we can move backwards from there. Uh, there was a question about uh, recycling um, and the, the the possibilities for recycling for rare earth in particular. You mentioned that only 1% uh, as of the stream is being recycled. What are the options for recycling rare earth elements in particular? And are there any ongoing initiatives that is targeting this element of the waste stream that can re reduce our reliance on uh, new mines, for instance? Yeah, thank you for that question. And also, um, you know, thanks uh, uh, to everyone for the wonderful questions that you put into the Q&A. Let's, we'll do our best to address them and also please keep them coming. Um, so as far as recycling goes, uh, the fundamental challenge is this. There, um, it comes down to organizing the social and legal infrastructure to scale up recycling, much more so than uh, tackling the technological challenge. Here's why. Researchers um, in the Americas, in the EU, in China, in India, Australia, Japan, have been working for years to um, develop improve, and improve techniques to recycle rare earth magnets, um, uh, different uh, rare earth bearing technologies and all of this. And they haven't been able to uh, scale up these, uh, these innovations because there's no uh, formalized collection mechanism. That's the primary issue. Uh, the second issue has to do with uh, industry concerns around uh, you know, proprietary technologies and things like that. So what that means is, you know, say, uh, a researcher at a national laboratory here in the United States uh, has come up with a technique to um, efficiently extract uh, rare earth magnets from computer hard drives um, and in order to recycle them. But there is no national and, and many states don't even have a system to collect this uh, technology uh, to centralize it. 
Um, so what that means then is that whatever uh, technology recycling does happen is kind of ad hoc, informal. I live in a state that technically does have an e-waste recycling collection program, but I just tried last week to find out where to drop off some of my old electronics, and it turns out it's not functioning right now or anymore. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is just tossed into the waste stream. Uh, with the result that um, we're one, we're losing track of of these resources, but two, we're mischaracterizing these critical resources as waste. There's another issue too, and I think many folks on this on this webinar are attentive to this, uh, which is that uh, electronic recycling is nasty business. Right. So I think many of us are familiar with images or perhaps you've even visited uh, villages in southeastern or western China where um, e-waste recycling is, is essentially a cottage industry, but of course it's um, entirely unregulated and pollutants are being released into the air, the water, and the residents who live there. Uh, there's a similar dynamic um, in, in Ghana uh, is another major destination for electronic waste. And um, perhaps less well known is the fact that um, prisoners in uh, US private for profit prisons are also uh, hired sometimes for, uh, you know, less than 25 cents an hour to process electronic waste. And so uh, the human, uh, the, the human element or the human costs of current e-waste recycling is dramatic and alarming. And so scaling up recycling without addressing this is a terrifying proposition. Um, so that has to be addressed. Um, I will I'll offer, I think, a preliminary explanation for why recycling is currently organized in this way. Uh, the first has to do with the fact that, um, that waste in a, it's a kind of a big picture thing, but waste in our sort of general contemporary conception is something that uh, we in consuming, uh, consumer driven societies are, are trained to think of as somebody else's problem, right? Our relationship to waste is that we send it away, right? But wherever that away is, um, you know, many folks from the uh, manufacturers and producers to the consumers aren't concerned with. We pay someone else to be concerned with that. Um, as a result, there's uh, very little oversight uh, into uh, the waste management and recycling management um, industry, such that uh, even uh, certified recyclers operating in the US context uh, end up ultimately shipping their stuff uh, to these informal or unlicensed sites overseas. Uh, there was one story um, that broke a couple years ago where some students at MIT put a GPS tracker in a printer and then they turned it into a you know, reputable uh, certified recycler and they tracked it over a year and eventually went and found it in a farmer's field in Southeastern China, right? So these practices are really a problem. Why is it organized in this way? There's the oversight issue, but then there's also um, the fact that uh, each of these technologies are different and unique. And so extracting rare earths, gold, other uh, valuable minerals or, or metals requires sophisticated and intricate human labor. Because the technologies are so different and so distinct, you can't automate that process. It's very difficult to do if you're going to do it at scale. Um, and so one of the things that would really help is if, um, if governments mandated certain design specifications, right? Not saying that every company has to produce the same laptop or what have you, but rather uh, that the part containing um, rare earth elements or the parts containing uh, nickel or gold are uh, modular, meaning they can be easily removed. Um, and then that way you could, uh, you could automate the process, you could scale it up, um, and you could also uh, move away from uh, this reliance on uh, exploiting people in other places that maybe don't have in, uh, interest or, or other options, I mean. 
Um, in order to make that happen, it requires a public investment. Um, the third reason why our current e-waste recycling situation is organized in this way is because uh, we are not investing in it. Um, and so, of course, companies have a responsibility there as well. Um, and some companies are working on this sort of ad hoc and uh, individually, but uh, we as a public also need to invest in building a circular economy instead of leaving it to the vicissitudes of the market. Excellent, thank you, Julie. And there was a comment um, in the chat from, uh, from Ted Smith that, that the funding for the e-recycling uh, was cut, which is, you know, speaks to your point about the necessity to put money into this, into this particular venture. Um, there was a question specifically about, uh, because in your map, you showed where there are uh, deposits all around the world. And of course, there are there were quite a few in North America. And here in the United States, um, there's a question from Jared Namark, there's uh, the Mountain Pass Rare Earths Mine in California, a very significant site. And he wanted to know what you thought the environmental implications were for restarting that, that particular that particular mine and also building out local refining as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the fact that that mine is located in one of the, uh, in, in a state with one of the most robust environmental regulatory frameworks is really interesting because it shows us what is possible uh, when industry is made to rise to the occasion. This is also a case where, um, uh, over time, as the ownership of the facility has changed hands, you can kind of see how different owners have or have not learned from uh, the environmental problems of the past. Um, the current ownership seems to have learned better than most uh, from the uh, environmental violations of the past. Um, specifically, what I mean is um, many of the past environmental violations had to do with wastewater management. Um, and when the mine originally uh, operated, uh, the wastewater was piped 14 kilometers off site to Ivanpa Dry Lake, uh, where it was then released into an evaporation pond. And so the waste management method there is basically you let the water evaporate and it just leaves behind the dust. But of course, this is a windy desert area. So that dust just blew <laughs> into the environment, right? Um, and this is a national recreation area and uh, home to uh, a number of uh, endangered or, or rare uh, planted animal species. And so this was really, quite problematic, but it was also sort of standard practice in the industry at the time um, and continues to be standard practice in many parts of the world. So um, of course there were, uh, without going into too much detail, there were a number of spills uh, because of um, you know, maintenance issues along the pipeline. And so uh, the facility was fined, they were sued, they uh, received angry letters from elected officials, uh, they were targeted by uh, activist actions and, um, and you know, profiled in, in newspaper articles. And, um, and eventually, you know, without addressing the environmental problems, uh, the facility shut down. New ownership opened it back up but rather than invest in, um, in making environmental improvements, they tried to kind of cut corners. And so uh, whenever there were surprise inspections on site, they found that the wastewater containing heavy metals, radioactive materials, acids was just being dumped into the stormwater system. Um, and one documentary filmmaker found that uh, water was actually being hauled in semi trucks to the coast where it was then dumped into municipal sewage treatment plants and then eventually released into the Pacific Ocean. And of course, municipal sewage treatment plants don't filter out industrial waste, right? So it's effectively just dumping it into the Pacific Ocean. Current ownership has, has decided to um, uh, try and get around this entirely. And so they've developed a, an on-site an on water recycling system. 
So their strategy is no water leaves the site, right? The water is recycled on site and the waste is, uh, the waste is not uh, stored in its wet form. The water is removed first from the waste and what is stored as waste is a much smaller uh, solid uh, waste, right? It's just basically dust and grit that they store on site and then they progressively bury, right? So it's a much smaller waste footprint and uh, it deals specifically with the environmental issues of the previous decades. And so that, from an environmental standpoint, that is something of a victory, right? But it shows that it takes uh, years of disciplining uh, the industry in order to um, force or stimulate or inspire, I guess, these important improvements. Excellent, thank you. Um, there was a question that came in before uh, by email, um, and I'm going to combine it with another one because you provided some very useful information about this particular uh, mine in California. And there were two other kind of region specific questions. One was, are there any rare earth minerals in Ukraine? Um, and you have already said that you know, there's this perception that because these are rare, but they're not rare, that somehow they play a role in, in conflict or generating conflict in order to gain access to them. So of course, Ukraine is in the headlines as the conflict that we're focused on, many people are focused on at the moment. So um, if you could talk about that. And then someone in the, in the uh, Q&A wanted to know about Congo, whether you have done any specific work around uh, rare earth elements there. Hey, great, thank you. Thanks for those questions. Um, so with respect to whether there are rare earth elements in, in Ukraine, um, the first answer is yes, because rare earth elements are ubiquitous in the Earth's crust. You could, you could go outside and dig around. And if you sent what you, what you dug up to uh, be analyzed, chances are you would find some trace of rare earth elements uh, because they are really quite common. Uh, the question though, is whether there is a mineable deposit. Um, and so the thing that makes rare earth elements challenging economically is that even though they are so dispersed, um, a deposit where you have something more than two or 3% of the total material is actually rare earth elements is harder to find but it is among those more than 800 sites uh, that I showed you on the, in the USGS map. Um, with, respect to, uh, with respect to the DRC, um, there is of course, um, as you probably know, um, the primary uh, or the most high profile uh, mineral commodity exports from the DRC are cobalt, uh, tin, tungsten, tantalum. Uh, rare earth elements are also present in the DRC. And one of the things that we're looking into in the context of another research project that I have going on right now is you know, whether, um, whether they're being exported under a different name. So the reason that we're looking into that is that we know that um, a number of countries, um, it's been found that a number of countries are exporting and importing rare earths under a different name. They're often exporting or importing rare earths simply as sand or something like this, right? And the purpose of this is, is to, of course, get around taxation um, or tariffs, uh, but also because rare earths are politically charged because they're called rare and they're part of these critical materials and all of this, um, it's also an effort to avoid uh, extra scrutiny that might be resulting from uh, wanting to open up a uh, rare earth mining facility as opposed to wanting to open up a sand mine or something like this. Um, so we don't have official data yet. Uh, we're just trying to get a, a handle on what the potential volume might be. Excellent. I wanna make sure that we also cover the questions that are coming in in French, which requires me to, to Thank you. scrambling <laughs> to, uh, to get those translated um, and to remind people that there is interpretation. So um, you, can, you can hear uh, this in French and English. Um, one question that came in in French was, what can a country do uh, if you're relatively weak when it comes to geopolitical power? Uh, you're in the global south, you have rare earth minerals, there's 
a company coming in, maybe it's from China, maybe it's from the United States, Canada, uh, that wants to set up a mine uh, that is probably going to uh, have environmental impacts on the community and on, on local people. What can you do as a country? What kind of national strategies do you have available to protect the environment and protect the people and communities? What are the national strategies? And do you have international mechanisms that you can um, use to, uh, to protect your local environment and communities? Uh, thank you, that's an excellent question. Um, and this is, this is one that's confronting a lot of different localities around the world. Um, so the first thing that I would say, and my first answer, uh, assumes uh, government officials who are interested in protecting local people and environments, right? So that's that's the assumption that's um, that's part of my my first response. Uh, in that case, the terms between um, the relevant government agency and the company are crucial. So, if uh, the overwhelming momentum is for um, for a company to come in and set up shop, a foreign company to come in and set up a mining operation in your country, then at the very least, there needs to be mechanisms to make sure that revenues are collected from that company, right? So that the government is actually gathering revenue from the extraction from day one. Uh, I say this because it's often the case that um, that agreements will not charge any royalties or not charge any taxes or royalties for a period of 10 or 20 years. And uh, this effectively robs <laughs> the country of a share in the production. And those are funds that could be put toward all sorts of things. Um, now, there's a complicating factor here, which is, you know, depending on whether or not the country um, is an IMF debtor state. So um, they may be confined, the government may be uh, constrained by the terms of their loan with the IMF in terms of what regulations they can impose on transnational companies. And uh, that's part, of course, a broader question or a broader set of issues, but I do think that it can and does uh, play out uh, in the extractive industry domain. Um, that's an opportunity to, uh, to align with broader movements to adjust or transform the terms of these IMF loan agreements or even um, to cancel uh, debt or eliminate these terms so that um, so that they don't undermine uh, countries' self determination to such an extent. Um, another uh, another my second answer, of course, assumes the opposite, which is that um, the instrumental people who are uh, occupying the government offices um, that are that have decisive power. Um, are very much interested in attracting foreign direct investment in the form of extractive industries and uh, want to do it in the fastest way possible. And, um, you know, of course, sacrifices must be made, right? If you're going to have this kind of industrial driven development, if that is the mindset. And I've encountered this um, quite a bit in my research over the years. If that is the mindset, then local and transnational organizing is crucial. Um, in order to um, in order to pressure the relevant officials to do the right thing. So um, of course, what counts as the right thing depends on your circumstance. It might mean trying to block the process. It might mean uh, relocating the facility if it's uh, slated to occur in um, in an important uh, environmentally and socially significant place. Um, it might also mean, um, you know, trying to block it entirely or simply to change the terms, whatever the term, whatever the stakes are of the struggle, of course, organize around those uh, locally and transnationally. Um, the third response that I have to say relates to the second, which is 
say, uh, which is often, I think, more reflective of the actual reality. You have some people in government who very much want and need uh, this uh, to attract this foreign direct investment, whether it's for um, the pressures of their office or fulfilling the national mandate or there's personal gain. You also do tend to have people who are um, concerned or have reservations about it or are opposed to it for any number of reasons. And that's where um, social organizing is especially important because a robust social movement gives the people in power the courage to do the right thing, right? And when I say that, um, you know, I'm uh, channeling an insight from the former French ambassador for uh, climate negotiations, Laurence Tubiana, who made that observation around the 2015 Paris Accord. The presence of a robust social movement helps the people in power have the courage to do the right thing, particularly when they're face to face with, um, with opposition. Excellent. That was a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. <laughs> I want to remind people, uh, if you're seeing other people's email addresses in the chat, I'd asked uh, if, if anyone is interested in joining a, a new network that focuses on rare earth elements um, to either send uh, me uh, your email address, and I'm putting my email address again in chat, or you can send it to me uh, via the chat function. Um, Julie, a number of questions have come in around this around this issue of safe mining, uh, less risky mining, green mining. In other words, you know, sometimes a a, a rare earth uh, extraction company will say, "Yes, we we know that there have been bad practices in the past," and of course, you you talked about that in terms of the California facility, um, but we're different. We have you know new techniques that far less risky, far less impact on the environment. We're going to do this right. Uh, is that true? Or is that just another version of greenwashing? Well, uh, yeah, I see a number of questions along, along these lines, some general and some specific. Um, look, I think that uh, the people who are promoting these less risky, greener and safer mining techniques truly believe what they are saying. Um, the problem is whether they have the expertise to actually uh, credibly make that claim. So this actually, what I have to say, um, also answers a little bit of the previous question, which is if a company is claiming that their technique and technology is less risky, that uh, they have a, you know, uh, end of end of the life of mine plan which will restore the landscape to what it was before or even some claim better we'll leave it better than we found it um then you have every right to ask uh you know who are the environmental scientists the soil and water scientists um uh, the conservationists that they've consulted in developing that technology and of course, you have every right to ask for, uh, for those materials and to then uh, refer those materials to, to experts who can evaluate them uh, and give you a sense of how credible they are. Um, so the example of the facility that I described in, um, in Southern California, uh, that's an example where that one fix, right, um, of developing an on-site water recycling technique so that they're no longer discharging or piping uh, waste material elsewhere. They're reducing their overall water use and they're also reducing their total waste footprint. That is a real improvement. Um, it still means that you're accumulating waste on site and that waste is going to be there even if you bury it, <laughs> it's still going to be there. Um, but it's better. And so I think that that comment actually, I think should give you some insight into what is actually possible within uh, the mining industry. There are better practices that are possible, but there is no such thing as zero waste or zero impact mining. And often um, uh, uh, 
I would say that an overwhelming emphasis is placed on appearance, right? So um, if a facility buries their waste on site and then they bring in topsoil from somewhere else and then they, you know, plant grasses and trees and all of this, um, you know, they can point to that and say, look how green it is. Look, the landscape is restored. But the fundamental question is whether or not that landscape is contaminated. Right. So whether the plants and the animals are taking up mine waste um, in their system um, just by virtue of, of living and growing in that place. So I would say subject everything to scrutiny to scrutiny and be skeptical of claims that, you know, this is safe. This is environmentally friendly. This is the best technique, while also bearing in mind that there are a number of techniques that are better than how we've done things in the past and that the people promoting them believe in them, right? And so you can make them, I think that's an advantage because you can then work with um, the sustainability folks within a company or what have you in order to get the information that you need to, um, to subject it to a third party evaluation, find an, find an expert who can look at it. And if the facility is determined or if you know the powers that be are determined that the operation go forward, they can suggest improvements, right? It can be a process of productive engagement, potentially. Excellent. Um, there have been a number of questions about kind of the, the um, organizing by groups, both in the global South and in the global North, um, to uh, either oppose specific uh, rare earth element mines or to change the practices of existing mines. Um, I'm wondering if there are any uh, examples you can give where you think that has been successful or has been uh, well thought out strategically and has there been um, some useful um, cooperation between groups in the global north and in the global south on these issues? Mm. Well, honestly, for the most part, um, I've seen the struggles are, are very isolated in place. Um, and so one of the reasons why um, I'm, I'm so happy about this conversation that's happening today is that, you know, um, this is, uh, you know, quite possibly building a, an international network uh, around uh, rare earth mining and processing. And um, typically what I've seen is that, you know, it's local locally based social movements that draw strategically on national and international allies and resources uh, in order to uh, make sure that their concerns are addressed. So for example, uh, one of the things that I studied while I was um, researching this in China uh, was in fact the history of local environmental organizing, the work of environmental journalists, um, regional and local public health researchers, social scientists, water scientists, uh, who really for a number of years put a lot of pressure on different parts of the government in order to, um, in order to get information on uh, the contaminants that were being released into their environment and address them or provide compensation for people uh, who were impacted by this. And although this is never part of the story internationally, right, you have to be there locally talking to the people who are involved in order to get this story. Um, this grassroots environmental organizing, some of it was coordinated, a lot of it was ad hoc. You know, members from this village petitioned that official, members from this organization worked with people from this village to coordinate with this scientist to put pressure on this part of, of an industry, right? It was ad hoc, but it was persistent over years. And that ultimately was instrumental in shaping government policy at the local uh, state and national level to consolidate and clean up the industry locally. All right, so that's, that's an example from within China where uh, grassroots pressure is instrumental actually in changing practices. Um, you know, that of course is not the only factor, but it is a significant, and I would say a determinative factor uh, that is often not told simply because it's hard to know unless you're there. 
Um, another example um, that that I think was actually effective, really effective, and a case of local, national, and transnational organizing had to do with the uh, Linus facility in Malaysia. And so, um, you know, you can look this up. There's a number of stories, um, but the uh, SLSM movement, Stop Linus, Save Malaysia, um, effectively, um, it built on the already robust uh, environmental organization organizational network within Malaysia, uh, drew in transnational resources, reached out to journalists and all of this in order to, an international organization, in order to make sure that local concerns, which were based in very real things, very real terrible things that had happened um, as a result of um, socially and environmentally irresponsible rare earth, my, rare, rare earth processing locally um, in previous years to make sure that those concerns were addressed. And, um, and I think that, uh, that those two examples kind of show um, the importance of combining you know, local and transnational resources. But a major obstacle to this is that rare earth mining and processing is highly specialized. And so it's very difficult for people outside of the industry uh, to even know what they should be concerned about, <laughs> right? And conversely, it's very easy then for, for pro-mining interests to kind of like um, uh, bamboozle or confuse um, concerned parties uh, by resorting to very technical language that describes a specific part of the process and to present that as a solution to all the concerns. This is something that I've also observed. Excellent, thank you. And we had a nice shout out to Lee Tan um, on the chat, who was very much involved in that Linus work in, in Malaysia. Um, Great work. There's been uh, a couple of questions about um, what we might call uh, rare earth element aligned minerals, in other words, strategic uh, mm -hmm. elements that are not rare earth elements. Uh, question about uranium and whether uh, it should be considered a, cr a critical um, resource. Uh, lithium has come up. Obviously, lithium is critical in lithium ion batteries, major uh, 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 source of lithium in the, that triangle in, in South America mm -hmm. with Argentina. Um, what's the role of lithium in, in these struggles? And then um, there was a question also about open pit mining, and I, I'm not familiar enough with uh, how rare earth minerals are mined and whether open pit is a, uh, a technique that's used for that kind of mining and what the consequences are. So if you could address those as a collective group of questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, what counts as a critical material depends on who you ask. <laughs> you know, it also depends on, you know, which interest groups have um, managed to uh, influence, you know, the sort of public or government officials that are responsible for compiling these lists. Because an argument could be made for just about every element on the periodic table for its criticality, right? At least every element that we use. Um, and so I say that to kind of preface my remarks on um, uranium and things like this. So one of the things that um, makes rare earth mining and processing um, so complicated and potentially hazardous goes back to the geology, right? So the geological conditions under which a mineable deposit of rare earth elements will coalesce and concentrate are the same geological conditions that uh, result in larger concentrations of uranium and thorium. So often when you're digging up, when you're mining for rare earths, you're also digging up this other radioactive material as well. In fact, many of the rare earth mines that were discovered through the 20th century were discovered when people were looking for other things. They were looking for uranium and thorium. <laughs> and they also found, um, rare earth elements. Um, and so I think that uh, that actually speaks to then um, some of the broader issues with, uh, with the industry and how mining is actually organized in general, right? So uh, the challenge that this 
criticality uh, discussion is really making clear is that, okay, uh, certain groups, governments, um, ministries, companies, um, special interest groups are deciding that certain elements are really critical or strategic or necessary. But the overwhelming approach is to rely on, you know, the sort of the so-called free market <laughs> to address what has been defined as a strategic concern. And so this is why I think we see a lot of like incoherence and confusion around uh, mining and processing. I want to say more on that, but I want to make sure that I'm not drifting too far. Can you can you repeat the final question, John, just to make sure that I address it? Uh, sure. I mean, it, it was about open pit mining and the, yeah. uh, the implications or the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so open pit mining, uh, just for those who um, are, are not familiar. So um, if you picture a big mine as a big hole in the ground, that's open pit mining. Um, that is contrasted with shaft or subterranean mining where you sort of dig a hole into a mountain or dig a hole in the ground and it's very narrow and you extract the material through the shaft. And so from the surface, um, you don't see uh, nearly as dramatic of a footprint. Um, so the largest uh, rare earth mine in the world located in Northern China is an open pit mine. Also, so is uh, the mine in Southern California, that's an open pit mine. Um, there's a number of, um, of smaller scale mines um, that are extracting rare earth elements from clay or from sand that they aren't shaft mines, but they also aren't open pit because it's basically not a pit. They're doing kind of shallow surface dredging. So they might they might uh, remove um, anywhere from the top two to the top 20 meters of sand and topsoils. Um, and that's a kind of excavation or dredging uh, that that isn't again, it's not an open pit and it's not a shaft. They're basically scraping up the surface <laughs> to get the materials that they need. All of these um, disturb the ecosystems that are uh, contained in the surface layers of, you know, whether it's soil or forests or grasslands or what have you. And from a climate greenhouse gas emission standpoint, this is, I would say, the greatest mystery um, in terms of measuring the total impact of different mining practices, because very little is understood about uh, the role of microorganisms, very small little creatures in the soil and plant matter on the surface in absorbing and capturing greenhouse gases. Very little is understood about the volume and the role, but it is generally understood that they are crucial in greenhouse gas sequestration. And when those ecosystems are disturbed, they then become another source of greenhouse gases, whether it's CO2 or methane or other greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And these are, these have not yet been accounted for. So they aren't included in, uh, you know, the carbon footprint estimations or the greenhouse gas emission footprint estimations of different mining activities. And they're all, that means they're also not uh, accounted for in sort of national inventories or tallies of greenhouse gas emissions. And they're also not accounted for when um, new mining or prospective mining operations are trying to make the case for uh, how environmentally friendly they might be. Excellent. Uh, there are a number of folks on this um, uh, Zoom call who are from Madagascar, and I'm, I'm sure that they are interested in, in hearing your, your thoughts on the situation there. Um, I mean, there was one specific question about well, what, what, sh what rate should the government be asking in terms of royalty or, or, or a tax on, on uh, rare earth. But if there are other insights you might have about um, the situation in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Well, the specific one is really, um, uh, I would suggest looking around uh, for examples 
uh, for what different countries or even different states charge for royalties. Um, Alaska, a state in the United States, charges a 25% royalty, right? Um, you know, you can contrast to other states just, just within the United States that don't charge anything. <laughs> and in fact, they don't collect taxes for 10 years or 15 years. Um, so the uh, facility essentially operates not for, not for free, but at an immense public subsidy, right? Because the public assumes the cost of maintaining the infrastructure and all of this to operation. And so, um, you know, if the government is, uh, if people within the government are looking for a number and then a defense for that number, I would, I would cite the Alaska example, right? That there's precedent um, in different parts of the world for uh, charging these different rates. Um, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, they, uh, they have a, a set of guidelines for uh, tracking how those royalties are collected and then how they're um, allocated um, or redistributed under the national budget. And so that would be a really useful uh, organization to follow up with, um, EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Um, and then with respect to um, the situation specifically in Madagascar, this um, is a situation to me, now I haven't been to Madagascar, um, so I can't speak with, um, with firsthand experience or expertise to the situation on the ground, but I, I will instead share um, my analysis from afar. It seems to me to be an example um, that really uh, crystallizes the tensions between uh, you know, increasing mining in order to get the materials that are needed to, um, to actually make this urgently needed renewable energy transition possible versus um, you know, undermining and uh, destroying uh, important local social and ecological systems. Right, important local social ecological systems that need to be intact so that people can be more resilient and less vulnerable to the intensifying effects of climate change. Right, so the situation in Madagascar really uh, crystallizes that tension for me. And so um, I think that one of the things that, uh, that can and should be done is um, uh, a local uh, climate resilience or climate impact survey, right? So where the, uh, the impacts on local people's climate resilience um, needs to be uh, taken into account. What happens if farmers lo lose access to their land or what happens if forest resources um, are enclosed and no longer accessible? What happens if water resources are contaminated? to the local and regional livelihoods, and who then is responsible for uh, compensating or bearing the cost of, um, of those impacts. Um, this is something that I'm, that I'm working on at the international level to make sure that there's an international mechanism for this, uh, because the renewable energy transition cannot proceed by destroying the landscapes and livelihoods. Um, of local people around the world and thereby rendering them um, more vulnerable socially, economically, and then especially in the context of intensifying climate change. You, you mentioned something there that's very intriguing and I don't, I don't want to lose, uh, lose track of that. And that is you're working on an international mechanism. Um, and what, 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 would, what would that look like? Okay, yeah, so this is, um, uh, this goes back to some of the work that I mentioned at the very beginning of, of my remarks today with the International Standards Organization. So the International Standards Organization is headquartered in Geneva, and they have a host of standards for uh, industry worldwide, whether it's occupational, health, safety, environmental management, efficiency, uh, you name it. Um, their standards are entirely voluntary. Right, uh, but the their operating principle is that uh, delegates from ISO member states, which includes most countries in the world, uh, will then 
uh, work with their governments to align government policy with the international standards organizations standards. And so we've seen this in a variety of different areas. Um, so EU member states um, are quite good about aligning um, ISO standards with domestic policy, adapting or selectively adopting some of it. Um, in recent years, we've also seen this uh, with respect to China, Japan, and Korea, um, that their delegates have been uh, uh, very, very diligent and very effective on, um, you know, working to develop these international standards and then bringing these standards back home. In the U.S. context, it's much more of a challenge. I mean, the U.S. mining code hasn't been updated since 1870, <laughs> just to give you a sense of how dated things are. Um, and so instead, the approach in the US context is uh, to work with individual companies to um, pursue uh, certification themselves. So that's the framework. Uh, what I'm working on specifically are uh, sustainability standards for rare earths. And um, the mechanism that I'm working on uh, getting incorporated is precisely what I, what I just suggested, that um, that there is a, you know, similar to a sort of environmental and social impact assessment, which of course, you know, those are problematic, controversial, and often not effective ultimately, um, but that there is a, uh, an inventory and analysis of the climate resilience impacts of a proposed mining operation and that uh, this analysis be carried out by, uh, by parties that are mutually agreed upon between industry, government, and civil society, uh, and that the findings uh, be disseminated in locally appropriate ways, right? So that they're not held in a binder this thick in an office somewhere, and that counts as transparency, but rather that they are um, disseminated and can be commented on. Um, as part of the process for uh, ensuring that uh, a mining operation that is being promoted in the name of you know, uh, climate mitigation and climate resilience is not in fact doing the opposite. Because I'm working within the International Standards Organization and these standards are for industry, right? That is, um, that's an approach that I'm taking that's targeted toward industry actors. But I think that that social movement, civil society, researchers at universities um, uh, can, and in fact, many already have, or this is present prevalent in, in some of the organizing, um, to uh, present this argument or conduct this analysis themselves, right? Instead of waiting for a company to decide to do the right thing and to use that as part of the organizing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm, I have two more questions lined up. I also want to do a check in with you, Julie, just to make sure you know you are you have enough energy to continue. Um, we also have a wonderful translator, John Wani, and I don't want to overburden him as well. Um, so, uh, so I have those two questions lined up. I also recommend people check out all the resources that others have been posting in chat that are extremely valuable. Um, the last two questions, and you know, we can reevaluate and add if, if necessary, but one is substitutes. Um, you know, as you said, rare earth elements, we've known about them for hundreds of years. That's given us plenty of time to come up with substitutes for them. Um, although, as you said, they have unusual properties when it comes to uh, conductivity and, and magnet, magnetism. So um, I, I imagine it's challenging to come up with uh, precise substitutes for these, but is there anything that you know of this in the pipeline, um, metaphorically, uh, that can provide substitutes for, for these elements that are made perhaps of uh, something that's synthesized that doesn't require uh, an extractive process? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for your check-in questions, I have another hour. Um, so if folks need to go, that's fine. But I'm so happy that, um, you know, that this group of people has come together that I'm here, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to discuss things for another hour before I need to go to my next engagement.
um, as long as our interpreter or translator can hold out for that long <laughs> as well. Um, in terms of interesting uh, substitutes, this is a really interesting conundrum because um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the beginning of my remarks that uh, you know the thing that makes rare earth elements so useful is that they have this fantastic magnetic and conductive property properties. Um, and so, in order to substitute, uh, you need to find another element that also has a sort of similar or comparable property. And so, um, so for example, we've seen. Um, you know, over the past decade, uh, other elements like vanadium, for example, um, have been substituted for rare earth elements, um, or even tellurium. And these are, they're not part of, you know, the that set of 17 rare earth elements. But the issue is, um, with that case of substitution, you're taking the issues from one set of elements and just transferring them to another set of elements. Um, there was a lot of effort, um, you know, at the beginning of the decade uh, to find substitutes because uh, at the time, uh, you know, China uh, was responsible for 97% of rare earth production. And so, you know, folks in the US and Japan and, and the EU were very interested in finding other substitutes. But it turns out that because of the way that uh, global industrial geography is organized, a lot of those substitute elements are refined in China as well, right? Um, where there are interesting developments um, has to do with efficiency. Right, so uh, reducing the total volume of a certain material that's needed uh, in a particular application. Or actually, before I get into that, I wanted to note um, with the case of solar panels, and again, this concerns not an element that's not a rare earth element, but it is an example of a uh, really exciting uh, substitution. So it used to be that uh, tellurium was really important for solar panels. Um, tellurium is hard to get, it's expensive. Um, and that was a bottleneck actually for a larger scale solar panel uh, production. Um, but material scientists figured out how to, how to substitute silica, which is basically sand and is much more common uh, to perform the work that was performed by tellurium. This took several years of work to do. Um, and because, you know, uh, you have to then uh, retrofit or update uh, your industrial machinery in order to do this, right, it takes several years then for a substitution like this to become ubiquitous. Uh, but that's an example of the kinds of things that are possible uh, when people who are able and want to experiment are, of course, supported in that experimentation. Um, so most of the gains that um, most of the gains that I've seen have to do with efficiency, right? With reducing the actual total amount of elements required. Uh, that's important. Um, I will reiterate though, um, that uh, reducing the total amount of an element that's required for a specific technological component is great, but it's even better if that specific component is made in such a way that it can be easily reused, repaired, or recycled so that it can be plugged back into the supply chain without having to induce uh, new additional freshly mined material. Excellent, that's very helpful. Um, there was a question if, uh, as to whether this would be available uh, as a uh, presentation, and I assure you that it will be, it is being recorded. Uh, so the video will be available and we will also have a written summary available. If you want to uh, make sure that you have access to that, you can either send me an, uh, an email uh, or you can sign up uh, at the Global Just Transition website uh, where you will get additional uh, updates on uh, the other projects that we're working on, which involve um, Chinese investments in Africa, consequences of Green New Deals uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and a number of other projects. Um, that other question that I, I mentioned was uh, 
uh, someone asked uh, how you deal with objections <laughs> to to your uh, to, to the presentations you make, um, and they weren't very specific about what those objections were. But I imagine, for instance, someone could come to you and say, "Julie, look, we are in a crisis right now. We have to have a clean energy transition yesterday as quickly as possible. We do not have time uh, for." you know, a lot of elaborate, you know, discussions about, you know, how to access these min minerals, uh, how we need them now. And, uh, and so I'm sorry, but what you're saying is very nice with respect to environmental consequences and local communities, but the world is gonna end, planet's gonna blow up, we need them now. So how, how do you respond to that kind of question of urgency? Thank you. I'm I'm really sympathetic to it. Um, you know, the something that I'm living with and many of us are living with is the excruciating realization that 40 years ago we could have been as incremental as we're being now. 40 years ago we could have been this incremental and this gradual and created a very different future and present for ourselves. And so the urgency is something that I feel very deeply. Um, the urgency, I think, though, uh, forces us to only see one solution, which is to dig up more stuff. And digging up more stuff is something that takes so many resources, human resources, natural resources, of resources of finance capital, legal mechanisms, and all of this, that in our urgency to just increase the volume, of extraction, uh, we are overlooking uh, possibilities to help us get us to help get us out of this crisis. Um, that maybe yes will require energy and resources and capital and logistics, but maybe not quite as much <laughs> as a greenfields mining operation. And by that, I'm referring to um, not just e-waste recycling, but also reprocessing waste from other mine facilities in order to extract rare earths and other critical materials from these above ground resources that are just sitting there as massive heaps of waste. So I mentioned earlier in response to another question, uh, which was that, uh, you know, when you're, uh, when you're digging up rare earths, that's only like a small percentage of the total volume of stuff that you're digging up. And because most mining companies are only after one or two or three, or at most a dozen things when they're operating a particular site, it doesn't matter what else is there. That whatever else is there is treated as waste. And so this waste is accumulated in above ground sources um, and is just not being used, not being analyzed. Meanwhile, it's also a persistent environmental problem. So I think that um, that uh, looking at the resources that we actually have in front of us, uh, meaning including the things that we're currently mischaracterizing as waste, uh, will help us get to where we need in terms of the total raw material need um for the green transition um i sympathize with the urgency i feel it you know i'm i'm now the parent of a seven month old child and um it breaks my heart to think of the future that we've locked in at this point already um but uh, i would caution people to be uh skeptical of um urgency narratives that just the purpose of the urgency narrative is to intensify the status quo right the purpose of the urgency narrative should be to inspire us to look at things differently as a follow-up on that um there, there's a question of well how much can both recycling and dealing with so-called waste uh, how much can need will that meet? In other words, I, I know it's hard to give percentages, but let's say, you know, right now, as you said, very little of uh, uh, e-recycling actually brings, you know, um, uh, rare earth elements back into the, into the production stream. Um, and it sounds like very little waste um, processing brings uh, rare earth elements back into the production stream. 
let's say we were smarter, which is essentially what you're asking us to be, always important to be smarter. Let's say we were smarter and we were able to boost um, uh, e-recycling and waste treatment. Do you think we could meet current needs solely through those two processes um, and not have to uh, actually expand mining operations? Mm. Well, I think, uh, so first let me say this, recycling by itself, inadequate, right? Particularly if we're talking about meeting the projected demand increases, right? For decarbonizing our energy and transportation systems. Um, there's also, you know, the matter of the proliferation of uh, information and communication technologies, which also is another demand driver for rare earths and other critical materials. Recycling itself is not gonna get us there. I think. The fact is, we've recycled so little for so long, we don't actually know how much material is available in currently unrecycled stuff, right? The same applies for uh, the, the rare earths and other critical materials that are just sitting there as waste from a silver mine or a lead mine or a uranium mine. It's just sitting there above ground. We don't actually know how much is there, right? So um, while I, uh, want to be prudent and conservative and not advocate that we can meet all of our needs by um, recycling and reprocessing existing waste. Um, the third piece that we can add to that is, um, you know, with the uh, current and projected volume of existing operations, uh, I have yet to see an actual quantitative credible analysis that tells us that we can't get there, right? I have yet to see a credible quantitative analysis that shows us that it's impossible to meet our projected demand without, you know, uh, sacrificing tropical forest ecosystems or scraping up the ocean floor or mining the moon, right? Uh, the arguments advanced in favor of mining in those places are very compelling, but I don't think that they're actually based in robust quantitative analysis. And that's ultimately what I need to see in order to be convinced that mining in these places is absolutely essential. Excellent. Um, mm -hmm. There was a question uh, to, to talk a little bit about the, the specific consequences of rare earth element mining on environment and on communities. I don't know if you can give us a couple of examples of, uh, of that impact, because we've talked about it in kind of general terms so far, but can you give you any, especially from your research in China and Brazil, elsewhere, um, uh, what those consequences have been in very specific ways for very specific communities? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, First, there's the hazards that are presented by, um, you know, a mining operation itself. So without uh, proper protection, uh, people who are on the front lines of mining are exposed to the pulverized and fine particulate form of rare earths and other materials that come up in a mining operation. Uh, which leads to a number of respiratory and other ailments. So, for example, in my historical and statistical research on these issues in China, I found, you know, uh, government publications that tallied the number of respiratory related deaths and illnesses um, in the area. And in fact, uh, the primary causes of death in the area were um, accidents, right? So industrial mining accidents. Um, primarily, and then secondarily, it was respiratory related illnesses, right? And this is because, um, because depending on the element that you're talking about, it uh, disrupts uh, specific human systems and cellular operations in specific ways. Um, I'm gonna pause there where I'm talking about the beginning of the supply chain and hop to the very end of the supply chain 
which which is well the second to last step right um which is where uh, rare earth bearing technologies are present in our homes in our workplaces in our urban and infrastructural networks uh there has been some research in the uk and china respectively on the impact of the proliferation of these materials in our homes right so um one of the things that has been found is that um is that uh, certain rare earth elements, when they enter the human system and interact with human cells, they look an awful lot like calcium to a cell. And so uh, they can bind to calcium receptors uh, at the cell. So at the cellular level, um, the cell's not getting the calcium, which disrupts its communication with other, with other cells, which then can lead to a cascading set of uh, organ failures, right? Or uh, issues with um, uh, cognitive and neurological functioning uh, and related nervous disorders uh, to uh, uh, cancer disorders and reproductive issues as well. So that's kind of how it works on a cellular level. That, and this has been found um, to be the case in exposure sort of at the end of the supply chain. Going back to the beginning of the supply chain, um, a lot of the hazards associated with rare earth mining and processing have to do in addition to the issues with rare earths have to do with the other material that comes up and is released into the environment through a rare earth mining operation. And so in the context of northern China, where I did most of my research, the area also happens to be very geologically rich in arsenic and fluoride. fluoride. And so uh, these materials are pulverized and released into the environment, into the soils and water and have been now for several decades, uh, so much so that they produce now uh, very specific ailments in humans and animals in the region. One of the ailments is uh, skeletal fluorosis. So the way that this affects people is, um, you know, your long bones, your bones continue to grow and they become very brittle. Um, so you're more prone, prone to fractures and the fractures don't heal. But because your bones, just because your bones are continuing to grow, doesn't mean that your tissues are growing either. So ultimately, the it results in a debilitating and very painful condition. Um, and this also affects livestock as well. Um, and it's it's called known locally as long tooth disease, because the livestock's teeth continue to grow, but they become very brittle so much so that they can no longer eat and they eventually starve to death. And so this um, over the years was devastating to local and regional populations, which, you know, the historically uh, it's been the land of nomadic, ethnically Mongolian pastoralists. And so this sort of slow violence of environmental contamination uh, contributed to the destruction of those livelihoods in the place in, in place. Um, and there's, then, of course, there's the matter of exposure to uh, industrial byproducts, um, which, in addition to uh, birth, higher incidences of birth defects, cognitive and uh, neurological developmental issues, which have been documented by public health researchers in China for years, right? And that research was really important in shaping government policy. Um, there's also, uh, of course, um, issues with increased incidences of cancer. And so the kinds of cancer that become more prevalent in a particular place depend on the specific uh, industrial effluent uh, exposures that people have. And what makes that, uh, what determines that configuration is one, the separation techniques that are used to refine and process rare earth elements, whether it's acid leaching or roasting or some other um, chemical process combined with the actual materials that are present in the raw material that's dug up, whether it's uh, arsenic, fluoride, or other radioactive materials. So it's really that combination of factors that determines the risk factor for a specific place. And so I'll just end that sort of long response with a kind of practical suggestion, which is you know, in requesting information, uh, for prospective mining operations, it's important to ask about what else is present, to find out comprehensively what the regional geology is, so that you know what else is going to be dug up and released into the environment uh, as a result of the mining operation. 
Thank you. That's very, very helpful information. Um, I'm going to uh, suggest that we, we take basically one last question, and, but you can take as long as you want to answer because it's going to be a big question. Um, and that we try to, to wrap things up by one, um, one o'clock Eastern time here in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, to give you know, uh, our translator, John, uh, a rest <laughs> because he's been, I imagine, doing a lot uh, to keep up with all of this information uh, and translating it into French. So thank you again, John, for that. Um, the last question, uh, Julie, is really, you know, your book came out in 2017. So it's been uh, five years. And, uh, and I'm sure, you know, much of the research was obviously before 2017 when the book came out. Um, so things have changed. And, and this is, uh, in this last question, an opportunity for you to reflect on what you would um, add to the book if you had a chance to, to um, do a second edition or, or write a sequel. Um, there were a couple of questions that might fit into that, uh, um, such as deep sea mining, which you know has become an issue on the horizon. You, you, the topic of your book was, of course, the horizons of of, uh, of rare earth elements. So you know we're looking at outer space. Certainly, deep sea is is another horizon there. Um, also, uh, the impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative. China has certainly um, intensified its uh, investments uh, around the world, though. Um, there, ha it, there was a kind of a peak, uh, especially when it came to Africa in terms of uh, the amount of investment peaking maybe about five or six years ago and then and plummeting um, and then gradually rising again. So there, there are fluctuations, of course, in Chinese investment strategies. Um, so generally, what, what, uh, what would you add as part of a, uh, a sequel or an addendum to your 2017 book? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. And I see how it, you know, folds a number of questions uh, into it. Um, so a lot of a lot has happened. And um, my own work has, uh, you know, also evolved in such a way that, um, you know, my my focus is on, of course, doing this kind of work uh, with a number of different stakeholders and policymakers in order to uh, try and shift the norm away from, you know, the current uh, largely unimpressive um, and often quite dangerous status quo. Um, and in order to do that, that has required uh, me to really improve my uh, technical, my own technical knowledge base of different parts of the supply chain. So I've been focusing on that and learning where I can um, in order to understand what kind of incremental changes uh, can, can happen in order to reduce harm, right? In order to reduce the harm that's created. Um, in terms of uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the evolving uh, investment practices, um, one of the things that I've noted in the uh, extractive industry space is that uh, in part in response to intense international scrutiny, uh, scrutiny on uh, uh, China's uh, overseas investment practices, the strategy has shifted uh, to uh, something that's much lower profile, right? To in uh, to buying, to instead uh, working with existing enterprises or existing companies and buying minority minority shares in those companies um, that already have extractive operations uh, on the ground elsewhere, whether that's in Africa or Central Asia or Latin America. I mean, you know, even the also the United States and Canada. Right. Um, and so there's been a, uh, I think, a, a real diversification of approaches um, that's occurred in parallel with the more higher profile Belt and Road stuff, you know, uh, where depending on the country that's being approached, it, you know, opening a rare earth mining operation might be part of a comprehensive infrastructure aid and investment package that's um, offered or negotiated uh, as part of um, formal Belt and Road affiliation. Um, and so uh, the other thing that, um, that I've really focused on understanding is, you know, and, and this comes from 
you know, spending more time with uh, with new actors in in the mining space, right? This is, and by new actors, I'm referring to people who are motivated precisely by uh, the urgency of the renewable energy transition, and from you know a very pragmatic standpoint, want to make sure that uh, that the materials needed for that transition are actually available. Right. Um, and uh, spending time with with these constituencies in order to understand um, a couple of different things, but most practically speaking. Uh, so if you have people in industry who want to do the right thing, what's stopping them from doing it? Right. And um, and uh, that, I think, would be subject that would make a great subject for a second edition or a new book. But actually, given the urgency of the moment, um, I'm focusing my efforts, you know, not on writing another book, but actually on then moving between these different stakeholders um, and doing policy work um, in order to see if we can remove some of those fundamental obstacles. Um, it's hard <laughs> and incremental, but it's also um, uh, just looking at history, um, I really don't see how a challenging or complex problem has ever in itself uh, prevented dramatic change, right? When dramatic change is in fact necessary. Um, and so finally, uh, the other part that, uh, that I'm looking at is um, the whole complex of interests around uh, mining in these more extreme frontiers, right? So such as the, uh, such as the seabed or um, outer space, and uh, and try and really to understand uh, what the actual material uh, justification is uh, for those sorts of initiatives. Um, you know the way that uh, seabed mining is promoted, and and I think that people promoting this, you know, truly believe it, and I think that their belief is based on their best analysis of the situation. But the way it's promoted is it's kind of promoted as like a choice, like either you can have, uh, you know, uh, the conflict in the Eastern DRC and the devastation in China, or you know, let's just mine these things from the ocean floor. Nobody lives there, right? <laughs> it's a very similar logic um, that's presented in relation to outer space. Um, but uh, I'm not entirely convinced, one, that such exploitation is necessary if we actually take our total surface resources into account. And two, there is much more to the picture than that, right? Um, and so with respect to outer space, for example, um, you know, it's one of the things that uh, that I'm looking at is understanding um, how much of the drive to mine outer space is actually about addressing an actual possible materials crisis or bottleneck on Earth, and how much is is about developing the techniques and practices um, for you know space related uh, colonization and adventure, right? And if it's more the latter. You know, great space related people can do what space related people want to do, but it really shouldn't draw resources and attention away from the very serious uh, matter of our uh, need for a just transition here on Earth. I could go on forever, but I'll stop there. <laughs> so, thank you, Drew. That was really very helpful. I'm sure you, you were uh, intrigued to see, you, you mentioned popular um, culture references in the movie Don't Look Up when the asteroid is heading towards uh, to destroy the Earth, that the corporation sees it as this incredible trove of valuable minerals, rare Earth elements among them, I'm sure. And, you know, that, that in, in a nutshell is, you know, uh, the dilemma, you know, we're destroying or, you know, in the process of destroying the Earth to get these valuable uh, minerals that we need to quote unquote save the Earth. So. This is, uh, this, as you said, is a topic we could go on for several more hours to discuss. And I'm really heartened by the fact that so many uh, people have remained for the entire two hours. Um, it's been extraordinary uh, learning experience for me. Julie, you've imparted an incredible amount of information and, and knowledge. And uh, big thanks again to John Wani as well for translating this into French. Uh, we will be um, uh, 
publishing the video of this uh, and we'll make it available. I've put my uh, email again in chat if you want to uh, have access to that video. And I will also prepare a, um, a summary, uh, which I will give to Julie um, to fact check <laughs> before I <laughs> release it to the world. Um, and uh, all of that will be available within, uh, within uh, a week or two weeks or so. Um, but I would, again, I really want to thank you, Julie, for, for giving us such an enormous amount of time and information that's been so helpful. I hope that this will um, be a kind of a, a launch for a network of people from around the world working on these issues. Um, and uh, I really am so grateful to everyone who has shown up today uh, to listen, and we will be in touch, especially if you gave us your e email and otherwise other contact information. Um, but thank you again for, for, this, for this event. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you all. All right, let's be in touch. Mm -hmm.